So big question, where's the capital and where do investors think and how do investors think about it? And what is the role of community? So I am now really, really honored to invite the last panelist for today's discussion when community members commit as investors on the stage. But now let's welcome our very own Arno Hesse on the virtual stage. Arno, I'm so excited that you're moderating this session here. Thank you so much for doing that. You are an amazing co-leader and investor with Slow Money Northern California, and you have led multiple investments in food and the agriculture best business. You have co-founded community capital services like Credibles and Investable, and you're just spearheading this space here, Arno. So as you often say, if you eat, you're an investor. Arno, please take it away and introduce your fellow panelists, Alicia and Sharina, for this final discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Yes, I do eat and yes, I do invest. Um, so yeah, let's talk about investing. And uh, after all those amazing pitches that we saw, and uh, the theme for the day was also getting market traction. And what we want to talk about, there is a not well understood tool in the chest uh, um, for for entrepreneurs to actually have a connection between early market traction and getting early investors. That's not well understood. And we have been practicing this a little bit. And I'm very happy that we basically with Alicia have an entrepreneur who is using it with Srina, who um, uh, co-runs a platform where entrepreneurs do this all the time. And I will be chiming in a little bit like how I see uh, this working as an investor. So this is a, a great learning opportunity. So I would love uh, to um, like first introduce Alicia Kidd um, of um, Coconut, Coconut Noir Wine Shop and Bar. Um, and what's interesting, uh, Alicia is a, a wine maven, um, so to speak, and has been working in the wholesale business and um, for wine uh, quite, a, quite a while. And um, I don't know any, uh, any other black women who are uh, big in the wine business uh, besides Alicia. If anybody knows anybody besides Alicia, the drink is on me. Uh, but um, so she, she uh, and she is now entering uh, in Oakland, uh, I think great location uh, with, um, with Coconut Wine Shop and bar, a consumer customer facing side of the business. And it is not open yet. But you are out there, you have a campaign out there, you're raising a money for uh, a name for yourself. How do you do it? How does it work? How do people get to know it? So I'd love to start to um, Alicia to hear from you and, uh, and for um, a frank um, a disclosure, I'm an investor in her business already, um, having got to know her. But so how do you do this? How do you get the name out there? How do you get market traction before your shop is even open? Well, I, I will say just in summary, you just have to build your network. So even though for my business, Coco Noir is a new business, my existing business, the Wine Noir is actually an online, you know, part of it is brokerage, the other is online. So I've built a couple of thousand email database. So in a couple of thousand social media presence. So for me, in 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 opening a new company, which is really an extension of my current company and entering into a new field in the industry is mainly just early on before going on a platform. What I did was I did a, a map, a market, like a, a strategy of who I'm going to target. So I think what's important for new businesses is to tap into your network, friends and family, which is your seed round, which will be your biggest supporters. If you don't ha have that, start with your social media. Everyone has Facebook, I'm sure more than a hundred people. So just build, you know, do a mapping. So that's what I did. I, you know, mapped out my social media networks as well as my email networks and then contacts on my phone, business cards that I, in email marketing. So all of those things. And then I came up with a strategy and then I partnered with WeFunder and from there, we, you know, we just did organically, you know, for the first 77,000, um, we did it all our, I did it all myself, like sending out emails every week, 
um, posting on all my platforms. I'm part of six different social media platforms. Um, I did hire some people to do it, but as far as it was organic, and then I ramped it up with some Facebook ads for a little bit, but a lot of it was organic. So I think you just need to really look into your own personal network. How many, how many investors do you have uh, so far in your uh, crowdfunding campaign? Currently, I have um, 400 plus, around 420. Wow. A little bit under 420, so... Maybe we get it get it to five hundred after this event, but uh, yes. so uh, before I go to Sri, I just want to know it's like so you do it organically. You now you have four hundred already. What do you hear from them? Why the heck are they getting into investing in you before you even open and haven't seen the space? So, well, what is their response? What is what are they hoping from you, and why do uh, what do I, what do they see in you? Well, I think. Number one, because I already had credibility in the industry, but also I was able to transfer that credibility into messaging, a really nice crowdfund video. So throughout my raise, I've done two crowdfund videos, the first raise and then for part two um, raise. So having a really good crowdfund video that can convey your messaging. So most startups get funded in the ideation stage, which I call the idea phase, right? So having a good crowdfund video, that's what helped me and also my email marketing. I always was updating every week with what's going on in social media. So that is what, and plus I'm in an industry, I always showcase the, the wows of what's going on in the wine and diversity sector. So those are just some of the things that got people 400. I will say 90% of those people don't know who I am. Maybe 10% do. Thanks. Yeah. What I hear from a lot of people, they also really appreciate that you picked in Oakland. And if it's going to be su succeed somewhere um, first, it's going to be a, it's going to be in Oakland. And I think people were just like yearning and jonesing for a black owned wine business in the uh, black arts district in Oakland. So uh, Shrina has been a uh, member of our uh, community for for a while has uh, spoken at hold um, at Food Funded in the past. Um, Trina, you came from a big check investing at some time when you worked for OVC, and now you basically run the operation side as VP business of Republic.co. For those who don't know it, it's one of the um, um, platforms that blossomed after um, in 2016 uh, equity crowdfunding. Um, became legal so that it's not just the rich people were able to get into um, into businesses and Republic now you have experience now with hundreds of businesses like Alicia's business and help them to find funders um, uh, so that's we would love to hear is like how do how do people reach out and get people to buy in and by the way I just want to add one little thing Shrina is also doing this on the personal side, but probably you, most of you don't know. Shrina is actually running for Congress, uh, getting inspired by our political environment. And of course, she has to do her own crowdfunding for her own campaign from the community, which is interesting how you basically um, apply it now uh, to, your, to yourself. But let's talk about how, uh, what, does, uh, what have you seen at Republic uh, with startups that are not even in the market yet or just entering the market? Yeah, and I really appreciate how you made that connection because I do think that, you know, what you were saying, Alicia, at the beginning around just having to map your network, that's where it all starts, right? It's thinking about who your earliest supporters that might be. Some of them might be your family and friends. Others are your customers. Others are folks who want businesses like yours just to exist in the future and they realize that they don't exist currently, right? And so one of the things we say at Republic all the time is we're investing in the future we believe in. And some of those things, they, they just, they're not around yet. And right, and we need to actually capitalize them in order for them to exist in the first place. So I think this is a really exciting opportunity to be able to get the community involved for a couple of reasons. Um, when we talk about how to do it, the way that I like to think about it is that it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's not something that you can do all at once. It's not something you can do overnight. A lot of people think about crowdfunding sort of as an alternative to VC in the sense that, oh, well, I don't have to get all the warm intros. I don't have to go out there and pitch a bunch of investors. Um, I don't have to just get rich people involved. I can get my community involved. All those things are true, but the same way that you have to put in the work to get any sort of dollars from um, venture capitalists, you have to put in the work to get 
investment from your own community because they need to see why they should believe in you and why your business is going to be successful. So I think a big part of that step one, yes, is just mapping your network, figuring out who's in there, both on the personal side, on the professional side, and just thinking about, you know, when you're, when you're creating your pitch deck and you have that total addressable market, who's the total addressable market for your investors as well, right? Like who else can you reach that could become a part of your community that maybe isn't there just yet? So I think that's sort of where you need to start. And I think the second piece that's also really important is thinking about why people should invest in you in the first place. And I think there's a couple of different reasons why people do that. I think there's everything from who you are as the founder all the way through to the product or service that your business is actually building, right? So we have a lot of folks, a lot of um, companies on Republic are built by underrepresented founders. And that's a big reason why people invest. They're like, we just need more underrepresented founders in the world because they're going to be solving for the things that we want to see in the world, right? And that's as simple as that. So there, there's that angle of it of just like, who are the people who want to support people like you? Then there's the type of business model that you might be innovating in, right? So maybe um, whether it's a type of, you know, new, we've had smoothie companies to brick and mortar companies through software companies, right? Depending on the space that you're in, um, just thinking about why what you're doing is different. What is your competitive advantage? What makes you uniquely suited um, to actually prove to investors that what you're doing is going to work and they're going to be able to make money off of it. That's ultimately one of the goals for investors. And then all the way through to your actual product and service. One of the things that we see, um, there's a company called Bobby that raised on Republic. Um, they only had, you know, 198 investors, but they were able to raise millions of dollars. And they specifically gave, it's an infant formula company, and they specifically gave moms who use their product the chance to invest. And they saw tons of press, tons of inbound interest from even celebrities and influencers because of their campaign, because the thing that they were solving for was so personal and so relatable to so many people. And I think that's one of the beauties of doing a community-focused investment campaign is that you can tell your story. And especially as an entrepreneur, especially as a business person, you have the ability to actually tell your story now and get people not just interested in being a consumer and being a con customer, but actually being an investor. And you can almost see that as like negative customer acquisition cost, right? Like there, there's an ability of acquiring a new customer that is paying you to be an investor in your company. So I think um, there, there's a lot of really interesting things to think about, but of course it all comes down to, you know, what makes your business unique, what makes you unique and how can you showcase that to your community, to your potential community and your potential customers as well. Uh, good, good examples. And, and I think the rationale is, is, is really strong. Uh, if I may, actually, uh, uh, and, I, and, and I've, it's, I'm really glad that you brought it also up. Uh, we're looking also at different type of investors, because whenever like in our discussions, the word investors come up and people close their eyes, you usually see some rich white dudes right who are sitting at a conference table looking at spreadsheets and make decisions and we definitely want to change who we consider to be investors because if the investments actually that we're uh, uh, so touting um, uh, so bravely here were successful if it was just those investors we just made the richer even richer right we would just have contributed to widening the wealth gap uh, even even further instead of like changed who we consider uh, 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 being an investor. So now me being an investor to be, I'm not rich, but I, I can write uh, larger checks and I'm definitely a white dude. Um, so for me, the reason why I do um, actually like uh, companies um, to write, uh, to do uh, crowdfunding campaigns, there are three main reasons. So this is like the traditional investors, three main reasons why, why uh, uh, people like me actually do like um, crowdfunding campaigns. Number one, it bubbles up opportunities into our field of vision that I otherwise wouldn't see. For example, we still have Toriano Vegan Mob here. I actually saw um, Vegan Vegan Mob first on on the crowdfunding campaign we funder, and then I and then I reached out. Hey, you should, uh, how about you you, uh, you come to Food Funded, right? As we had uh, like some of your friends already uh, pitching here and raise money here. So. It raises the awareness for what traditional investors call pipeline. Reason number two is it's kind of helps me with the due diligence that I actually see product market fit. If I see 
hundreds of people being willing to write um, a small check that makes me more comfortable with maybe writing a bigger check. Also, when I have um, um, entrepreneurs telling me, oh, I don't want to do crowdfunding with so much work with all the outreach, then a, a flag goes up. Well, being in business actually takes a lot of work and outreach to, cu to customers in the first place. So it's a little bit of a test for me. How, uh, how much do you think uh, about market and uh, uh, product market fit? And, and reason number three is risk mitigation after the deal is done because never goes everything so sunny as you think in your business plan. And so, um, and do the revenues actually support it? And a few like rich dudes won't be able to buy all the um, organic um, tuna jerky or uh, all the vegan, uh, vegan burgers. But if you have hundreds of investors who are now your ambassadors that actually, and bring their birthday parties there and promote it to their friends, that actually does something for, uh, for the top line and is then risk mitigation for the business. So it, um, I just wanted to, to run that by you. So talking about ambassadors, a question is now um, to, to Alicia, and I also want to hear Srina, how do, uh, how do the other companies do this? Now, let's say you, you have 400 investors already and you may, get, you, go, you may blow beyond 500 and now you have like 500 investors. How do you, what do you do with that unruly crowd um, after they're in, uh, what does it mean for you in the future? In, in building your business now you you have all such a long like um not rolodex but such a large directory of directory what, what do you think it will do for you well for me I, or for any entrepreneur who decides to um fund crowdfund and then they close their round so what i'm gonna do at five with my hopefully five or six seven hundred um is to also keep them engaged. So typically with equity or crowdfunding platforms at the end of a raise, you do have to adhere to SEC document, I mean, guidelines by, you know, either annual report every year, um, you know, but what I will do is comply with that, but also doing updates, making sure the investors that contributed at the higher rewards get their prizes, get their perks. Also still doing either the quarterly, I will say monthly to quarterly updates of what's going on, keeping them engaged. Um, if you have product like I do, you know, use that as your customer base. You know, that is an audience. And I think that is attractive for if even if you go for future funding, you know, or just for, you know, at least some of that will be revenue bought back into your company. So I would just say those 500, I'm going to keep them engaged. I'm going to, you know, when my mobile app comes out, they're going to be the ones subscribing. When I launch the wine club, they're going to be the, the first customer base. Um, that is my soft network. They're my investors. So I will you utilize them to purchase, to champion, because they are now owners or community partners in my business. So they're going to advocate because number one, they want to see me do well. And then get when they look into their accounts and they see, oh, Alicia's paying them back. That gives them another sense of pride that they've also contributed to a, a main business in the community that is generating profit. So it, it goes full circle. So I would say anyone that is able to capture in um, a network that can invest in them beyond, you know, with an investment. Be, they will become your customers and et cetera. So you can massage that network to become so much more and they will be your, your ambassador. So I look at it like I have 500 or close to 500 Coco Noir ambassadors that are going to, as long as I keep them engaged, I keep them as my front line of what's going on with the company, the good and the bad, they will be my ambassadors to bring their extended network and then generate more profit for me. So it's your future frequent flyer club, if you will, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Before uh, before I hand that question to to uh, Shrina, to you, I just want to make sure um, uh, this will. I try to uh, refrain myself from that being the last question that I ask. Um, 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 Angie said uh, at the beginning, so we want to do a huddle. So ask your questions, put them into the chat. Priyanka will keep an eye on it and just uh, will bubble them up. Um, 
um, and then we just we're now a, a crowd where we can uh, handle the questions right here live. So uh, Sharina, um, with all the hundreds of enterprises that Republic has dealt with, probably some entrepreneurs are introverts, some are extroverts, some are considering many investors to be a liability and a nuisance, and probably others consider them an, an asset and opportunity. How have you been helping um, those entrepreneurs to deal with all the investors that they now have on the books? Of course. I mean, well, first thing, I have to play a little bit of a devil's advocate. Does anyone ever complain when they go from 10 customers to 500 plus customers who are now actively engaged and are going to be brand ambassadors for their company? I don't think so. Right. So I think, first of all, is the way that Alicia put it right. It's thinking about, you know, how can you actually leverage these new found investors to be true ambassadors for your company? And the fact that they are going to be some of your biggest advocates, um, we especially see it with food and beverage companies where every party they go to every time they're going out, if someone, depending on what your business is, whatever the way they can engage with your business, they're going to be telling all of their friends about it and bringing your wine to every party they go to, right? So I think there is a real opportunity to actually use your product and use the fact that these are so many investors who are engaged to actually get more customers, right? And actually grow your business. So rather than seeing it as a liability, really seeing it as an asset. Um, and let's give one example uh, with this company, Maven. They're a first round back company, Andrews and Harris, uh, Horowitz backed company. They raised over $750,000 from their community. And they said that their crowdfunding investment, I quote, their crowdfunding investment is one of the highest ROI items on their cap table. Right. And so this is one of those things can, that it's the gift that can keep on giving. It's not just that one campaign, but these are people who are truly invested in your company. Another example is a plant based burger company, um, Akua. The founder really leveraged their campaign to engage their actual community. They had over 2,000 investors and they used them to figure out new branding. They, you know, figured out their um, new campaigns that were going to be running. They used them for taste tests. They, they really leveraged their new investor base as a customer discovery platform and as a way to sort of test things before they open it up to the larger market. So I think there are ways um, that we can really turn uh, your investors into some of your most powerful customers on the platform. Um, I think one of the pieces that in terms of how Republic actually helps our entrepreneurs handle that, one of the things that we do is um, we actually we can make it one line on the cap table so it doesn't make it super messy. You don't have these hundreds or thousands of folks on your cap table, which I think can be really helpful for a lot of folks, especially if you're raising sub subsequent rounds of funding. And then the other piece is we have a tool called Social Capital, um, which actually allows you to leverage the expertise of the community, whether it's you know someone really knows about manufacturing or someone has a connection to help you uh, get into retail market, whatever it might be, um, just thinking about the fact that th these aren't just a handful of investors with limited expertise. These are investors who, you know, might be executives at potential clients, right, that you might be working with, right? So these investors are coming from sort of all walks of life. And I think you can actually leverage the power of this diverse array of expertise to actually continue to grow your company. Um, so I think those are just a, a couple of different ways that, that we support our entrepreneurs. Beautiful, uh, Srina. So we're going from smart money to social capital, right? Uh, uh, yeah, let's think about this. So uh, uh, Priyanka, um, interesting questions. Yes, we have a lot of interesting questions coming in and your discussions definitely prompted everyone to kind of think through and deeper. The first question was asked by Renata and in that she asks, are there any particular kind of businesses or models that tend to be more or less successful with crowdfunding campaign? Does anyone want to take a shot at this? I can just give a quick overview, I think there is a actually pretty large spread of the different types of companies that we see, right? So I think when you think of a crowdfunding sort of equity community capital campaign, um, you often think of direct to consumer companies. And I think there is a very natural fit. It's a lot of what we've been talking about here where your customers can become your investors. Um, I also think there's a lot of people who are just excited to invest in the future, right? And invest in the things that they want to see around. So some of our most successful campaigns have also been like B2B SaaS companies, right? And so I think it very much depends on how you tell your story and how you can sort of share your narrative, share why your company um, sort of deserves to be in the world and is going to be successful and how you can truly connect 
with your investor on a more, you know, almost like primitive level of why they should think what you're building is important to actually put dollars behind it. So we've sort of seen across the whole spectrum. I, th I do think um, direct to consumer does lend itself more to the community side of things, but we've seen companies across the board be successful in the type of business model. Thank you. Thank you, Srina. I, I just want to quickly insert to answer this on a very practical level, because today on this showcase, we have several companies who actually have open crowdfunding campaigns. Uh, we have uh, uh, Alicia's uh, Kokonoa wine shop is still open. So uh, somebody should put all the, uh, the links in, in the chat, please. So, and that is B2C, Vegan Mob is open, B2, uh, B2C, um, then we have um, our table is also open. That's also B two C, and then we have planetarians, which is B two B, right? So it's like we have like an, an, a number that we also selected to be, and and Firebrand uh, is open. That is uh, they're doing B two B and B two C, right? They have a cafe and and a bread factory. So it's it's a mix even in the food world of of B two B and B two C. Yeah. So other questions. Well put, well put. Thank you, Srina and Arno. It's really like an endless possibilities. The next question comes to us from Melissa Hansen. And I'm also going to add a little bit after that, if that's okay. Can you please talk about SEC registration process and costs? And I also want to understand, um, if possible, you know, what is it the effort that takes the entrepreneur to create a deck or so for the Republic? Um, to, to create a crowdfunding? Is it, is it that exhaustive a process? Um, I guess, uh, would yeah. Alicia or Srina be able to? I'll, I'll uh, let, let Alicia speak to it because she had to go through it herself. <laughs> yeah, so from the SEC process, what I recommend and what I did was you, and I'll say this, I don't know about other platforms, but what I noticed that they lack is that um, they need to have, I guess, people don't, are not really aware of the SEC process. I mean, you know, it's all new, you know? So I will say for me, have a lawyer, you know, because a lot of these platforms have their terms that they have. So you want to have a lawyer, I'm a, a security exchange lawyer um, that you consult with. And when you choose a platform, because there's many platforms, crowdfunding platforms, they already have their offerings. So you should have your lawyer um, be able to, if you say you pick Republic or WeFunder, if you decide which offering, then have your lawyer review those contracts ahead of time, and then they can work with you to help you register your company along with the equity crowdfunding platform. So the SEC process is not as, not as complicated when you have legal counsel. Um, doing it yourself is not, I would not recommend it. I would always say have a lawyer help you along with your lead investor, along with the platform account manager that you're working with. And, um, but the whole process, once it's done, it's, it's processed, it's already registered with the SEC. And then from there, you're ready to um, go. When it comes to the deck, um, if you write business plans already, um, you as an entrepreneur, that should be something that you, should do in the early stage of your business. So I would highly recommend like going to the different entrepreneur accelerators, the SBA or to score to learn about business plan writing. And then business plan writing is an extension. Your pitch deck is an extension of that. I highly recommend you write it yourself. I wrote my business plan myself because that allows you to understand how your business starts, how it pivots and how you exit. So writing a pitch deck is not hard. Yes, you can pay somebody to do the graphics, but I would recommend every business owner actually write out their business plan, farm, you know, write out their pitch deck. And then, of course, you can hire Upworks or Fiverr to do or a college student to kind of put it all together. But it's not hard at all. I would just add in on that pitch deck front. Um, I would just look at especially campaigns in particular if you're going to go this mm -hmm. route that are similar to yours and just look at their pages yeah. look at how they told their story what they decided to highlight look at the comment section um, there's a lot you can learn from people before you and so you know leverage that as a resource it's all publicly available information and so dig in there and figure out what you think worked for them and what you think will work for you 
Yeah, thank you. This was super helpful. I hope for, uh, also for the uh, others on the on this call here. Um, so I would want to close it with if you um, the platforms themselves have uh, gotten more helpful and have now, let's say, account managers who, who hold hands in the process. So it's not as scary as you uh, think it is. Uh, and Srina put a source uh, of her own platform into the chat right now. I um, also want to um, I put a link for Investibule, which is like an aggregation platform of uh, um, def, uh, of all the different platforms and in industry. Um, so you can overview if you just search for food in uh, California, you can see what do or in your state, you can see what do, what do other people do. So this was super enlightening. I hope it uh, uh, illustrates the connection between market traction and community investing for everybody and hope you consider it. I, as an investor, like it. I have seen investors write big checks uh, up to $100,000 on crowdfunding campaigns and small checks as low as $100 on those crowdfunding campaigns, but they become part of your fan club. So thank you, Alicia. And uh, um, thank you, Shrina. It was wonderful. So uh, back to Angie. Perfect. Absolutely. Wanted to join the thank you um, course that uh, Arno said. Big, big thanks to the three of you, Arno, Alicia, and Shrina.